So get this. The Earth acquires 40,000 tons of mass every single year. More and more people are being born, new buildings and structures. You might think that's something that adds mass, but nope. Since it's created out of existing matter on the Earth, it's actually dust falling from space to our planet. That dust consists of vestiges coming from our solar system, like space bodies that never managed to form into a planet, or asteroids and meteors that fell apart on their way and now drifting around. Our planet is there like a giant vacuum cleaner that pulls in all those particles of dust powered by gravity. So yes, Earth gains weight. But some calculations also say the entire planet, including the atmosphere and the sea, is losing around 50,000 metric tons of its mass annually. Gases like hydrogen and helium are within our planet's atmosphere, but they're so light gravity can't retain them there. So huge amounts of those gases escape our planet every year. 6 pounds of hydrogen every second. Sounds like a lot, but the Earth is really heavy, so it would take trillions of years for all the hydrogen to escape our atmosphere. Also, the planet's core is like some sort of big nuclear reactor. It runs all the time, so it gradually loses energy, which means it's losing mass too. Our planet is not a perfectly shaped sphere. It's more like a squashed one. As it spins, gravity is directed toward the Earth's center, while a centrifugal force goes outward. Earth has a tilted axis, so centrifugal force doesn't exactly oppose gravity. Also, gravity pushes those extra masses of Earth and water up at the equator into a bulge. Earth also has a waistline, 24,900 miles. You weigh more standing at one of the poles than at the equator. Although, for weight loss, Pluto comes as the best option. A 150-pound person would weigh around 10 pounds there. Avoid Jupiter, the same person would weigh over 350 pounds there. Our planet is all green and blue now, but chances are, it used to be purple. Scientists think ancient microbes might have used some other molecule to harness the sunlight instead of chlorophyll that gives plants their green color. That molecule possibly colored the living organisms into a more violet shade. The Earth is electric. Just one stroke of lightning can heat the air to over 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which causes the air to rapidly expand. That same ballooning air makes a shock wave we know as thunder. 6,000 lightning flashes appear all over the planet every minute, and the longest one occurred in the sky above Brazil, 440 miles long. Newer studies found out that the Earth's core is as hot as the sun's surface, over 9,300 degrees. The driest spot we have is the Atacama Desert of Peru and Chile. The center of Atacama has spots where we've never recorded any rain. The coldest place is naturally Antarctica, where winter temperatures can go down to minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm, no thanks. It's also the biggest desert we have on Earth. We imagine deserts as endless, sandy, and insanely hot areas. But there are coastal, subtropical, and polar deserts. They all have windswept and barren lands, which makes them very difficult for animals and plants to inhabit. The Pacific Ocean is the Earth's biggest ocean basin, which covers a huge area of almost 80 million square miles. The Pacific contains over half of the free water on our planet, and is so big, all of our continents could fit there. Earth used to have two moons, or at least that's something scientists believe. That second one was almost three times smaller than the one we have today, and may have orbited our planet before it slammed into the bigger one. This clash may be an explanation of why the two sides of the moon we're left with is not equal. And there are moonquakes going on. It looks pretty inactive from our perspective, but the ground there is definitely shaking, although less than on Earth. Moonquakes shake at great depths, especially midway between the lunar center and its surface. To get to the longest mountain chain, we have to look way down under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a chain of volcanoes that goes about 18,000 feet above the bottom and spans over 40,000 miles. We have a magnificent planet, more than 4.5 billion years old, which makes it 10,000 times older than humans. But it's not the same as it was in the beginning. The ground we walk on is recycled. Earth has its cycle. Magma from the depths of our planet comes up and hardens into rocky matter. Tectonic movements brings the rock to the surface where erosion happens. That's a process where wind, water, and other natural forces break apart rock and changes it. The small pieces get buried, deposited, and compacted into sedimentary rocks, like sandstone. 
if these rocks are buried deep enough, they get cooked and transformed into magma. So the whole cycle repeats all over again. We got used to seeing lava and ash coming out of volcanoes, but some of them even produce their own flashes of lightning. In 2020, the Tal Volcano, which is around 40 miles away from the Philippines' capital, Manila, started blasting smoke and ash pretty high into the air. Inside its ash column, small pieces were colliding and then producing lightning flashes people could see scattering across the sky. Lakes can go crazy and explode too. Neos, Manun, and Kivu are three lakes that sit above volcanoes. Since there's magma under their surface, there's carbon dioxide released into the lakes, which leads to a deep gas layer above the lake bed. It's pretty rare, but carbon dioxide can suddenly erupt from the lake and form an unpleasant gas cloud, similar to something a volcano does. 70% of our planet's surface is covered in oceans, but we've only explored 5% of them. And around 300 million years ago, I wasn't around then, we only had one massive supercontinent called Pangaea, with one huge sea, Panthalassa. Surprisingly, coral reefs are the biggest living structures. They consist of small coral polyps, but together they make a true community of organisms and a very important part of Earth's ecosystem. Some coral structures can even be seen from space. The Earth's surface is not evenly shaped, which means mass is uneven too. That way, gravity is not the same in all spots on Earth. There's a mysterious anomaly in the Hudson Bay of Canada. The gravity there is lower than in other regions surrounding this area, and scientists believe it's because of melted glaciers. During the last ice age, that region was covered in ice, which is now long gone and melted. But the planet hasn't completely recovered from the icy burden. Gravity over any area is proportional to its mass. The glacier left an imprint that pushed aside a part of the planet's mass, which is one of the reasons why the gravity is weaker in that area. Some bugs get nastier when in space, without gravity. Studies showed some bacteria, like Salmonella, can make worse damage in space because there's something in the lack of gravity that makes them tougher and changes their activity. The days on Earth are slowly getting longer. When the planet was formed, days were about 6 hours long and gradually got longer. 620 million years ago, a day lasted 22 hours. Today, we have 24 hours, but it's increasing by around 1.7 milliseconds every century. This happens because of the moon. It's slowing down our planet's rotation with the tides it helps create. When the Earth is spinning, tidal ocean bulges are pulled a little bit ahead of the moon-Earth axis. That makes some sort of force that slows down the rotation of our planet, which is how our days are getting longer, but really slowly. We'll have to stick to our 24-hour schedule for a very, very long time. Earth's core certainly seems to be far away from us, but the distance is not that big – 1,800 miles. That's shorter than Route 66. The strongest earthquake we ever had was in Chile, a magnitude 9.5. If an earthquake ever reached magnitude 12, it could split our planet in half. Also, if there's an earthquake happening, it can hit more than 400 miles under the surface, which is why people on the other side of the planet can literally feel that. Our planet has around 100 million times more individual viruses than there are stars in the universe. Clouds are not some fluffy things whose shapes we sometimes like to watch. They actually help regulate the temperature of Earth. If we could pull out all water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, That would cover the planet with a liquid film as thick as a human hair. And yet, such a small amount of water brings enough differences with the weather and climate. Our planet would be 13 degrees hotter if it weren't for clouds. You know, rotation is a funny thing. Not haha funny, but kind of strange. Not only can't you feel it, everything does it. From galaxies to atoms, the universe is taking us for a spin. Strangely, it was more difficult to prove that the Earth is rotating than it was to prove that the Earth is revolving around the Sun. Way back in 1610, Galileo, the father of experimental science, provided the first proof that Earth and all the other planets revolve around the Sun. Galileo showed in his telescope that Venus was going through phases like the Moon. The only conclusion possible was that Venus was revolving around the Sun. Case closed planets revolve. But it wasn't until 241 years later 
March 31, 1851 to be exact, that Leon Foucault proved that Earth was rotating. Foucault installed a giant pendulum from the 220-foot-high ceiling of the Pantheon in Paris. That's a lot of peace. An assembly of scientists and journalists watched as the floor turned beneath the giant pendulum. The Earth turns, they shouted, eh, mostly in French. Another strange thing about rotation is that although the Earth is rotating at a constant speed, the surface of the Earth is moving at all different speeds at all different latitudes. The same is true for every planet and star. At the equator, the surface of the Earth is moving the fastest, at 1,037 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is a mere 761 miles per hour. Halfway from the equator to the North or South Pole, at 45 degrees latitude, the Earth is rotating at 733 miles per hour. Standing at the North or South Pole, it would take you 24 hours just to turn around one time. And that's both boring and cold. One result of these differential rotational speeds of Earth is that it creates belts and bands not only in the atmosphere, but also on the surface of the Earth. Jupiter, of course, is famous for the belts and bands in its clouds caused by the giant planet's rapid rotation of about 28,000 miles per hour. The belts and bands on Earth's surface are somewhat overlooked, but we've got them too. We have white ice at the North and South Poles, and between the two poles, there are alternating belts and bands of dry sandy desert and moist green vegetation. This essential geography can be seen most clearly when we view the Earth rotating in space. Space agencies use the differential rotation of the Earth to their advantage. They launch their rockets as close to the equator as possible. NASA uses Cape Canaveral near the southern tip of Florida. And the ESA, the European Space Agency, uses the Guiana Space Center in French Guiana, South America, almost exactly at the equator. Because the land under a rocket near the equator is rotating at a greater speed, it gives the rocket a boost into space that launch sites near the poles cannot provide. You always want to save fuel, you know? Speaking of Jupiter, as I did about three paragraphs ago, the axis of rotation of the big planet is even less inclined than that of the Sun. The Sun is tilted at an angle of around 6 degrees, while Jupiter is only tilted 3 degrees. Jupiter stands almost perfectly upright, which combined with the great speed at which Jupiter is rotating – its entire day is less than 10 hours – it turns Jupiter into a giant gyroscope. Jupiter's gyroscopic stability, combined with its massive gravity, gives stability to the whole solar system. Jupiter prevents chaos factors from disrupting the orbits of the other planets. In other words, without Jupiter rotating like a stable gyroscope, the solar system could never have stayed intact for the billions of years that it has. Exoplanet solar systems are showing signs of chaos in their orbits. They could use a gyroscope like Jupiter to hold them together. Rotation is the real hero here. As for the Sun, its differential rotation has a big effect on its sunspot activity. Sunspots are spots or patches that sometimes appear on the Sun's surface, usually at mid-latitudes in both the northern and southern hemispheres of the Sun. As sunspot activity increases on the Sun, sunspots begin to move closer to the equator. Few sunspots are ever seen near the poles. With differential rotation, the gases at the equator of the Sun are moving faster than the gases at the Sun's poles. This differential motion of the gases twists the magnetic field lines in the Sun, causing them to snap. Sunspots are magnetic eruptions rising through the surface of the Sun, hurling electrified gases far into space and emitting intense ultraviolet radiation, often in the direction of the Earth. Uh-oh. Well, have no fear, Earth's differential rotation protects us. Not only does our Earth rotate differentially on its surface, but also down into its center. Studies of seismic readings of shock waves from earthquakes indicate the metallic core of the Earth is rotating slightly faster than the surface of our planet. Scientists think that the differential rotation of Earth's magnetic core within the slower rotating metallic liquid creates the magnetosphere arising from Earth's poles and extending far out into space. This magnetosphere keeps Earth safe from electrified gases from the Sun. Hurrah for rotation! Far out! Now, the 9.0 megaquake in 2011 off the coast of Japan rearranged the mass of Earth's crust and caused the rotation of Earth to speed up. The day got shorter. Eh, not much shorter. 1.6 millionths of a second. But we are accustomed to seeing the Earth's rotation slowing down. The Earth rotating through the tidal action of the Moon's gravitational effect on the oceans drains kinetic energy from the Earth's rotation, causing the planet to slow down. 
each day is becoming longer, about two thousandths of a second longer. Well, I need to adjust my watch. Leap years, we all know, are when we add a day to the calendar every four years, on February 29th, to straighten up Earth's yearly rotation around the Sun, taking 365 and one quarter days. But leap seconds are added to the clocks every so often to synchronize our clocks with the slowing rotation of the Earth and allow the Earth to catch up with our clocks, as if the Earth is concerned about our timepieces. 27 leap seconds have been added since 1972. The last leap second was added on December 31, 2016, and made the clocks read 6.59.60 p.m. Yeah, I didn't notice either. But the sun's rotation has unexpectedly been speeding up recently. Usually, it takes 86,400 seconds for the Earth to rotate, as measured by an array of atomic clocks in different locations on Earth and coordinated by a special service in Paris. Yes, they pay people for that. July 19, 2020 was the shortest day ever recorded, a whopping 1.46 milliseconds less than the usual 86,400. Gadzooks! If this keeps up for another five years, they may have to add a negative leap second to synchronize our clocks to Earth's increasing rotation. Computers and satellites won't like to see their clocks read January 1st at 0 o'clock, and they say time can't go backward. At least the Earth hasn't started rotating backward or stopped rotating altogether. That would be catastrophic. Everything would crash forward at whatever differential speed it was rotating on Earth. Yet, that appears to be what happened to the planet closest to Earth, Venus. Venus rotates very slowly backward, in retrograde, and that is very unusual. How so, you ask? Well, there are several theories to why Venus rotates in retrograde motion while all the other planets rotate in prograde or forward motion. Liquids inside a rotating sphere, like a planet, have a lot of inertia. That's why when you take an egg from the fridge, for example, and try to spin it, it won't spin. The liquid inside is just sitting there. Its inertia is resisting your attempt to spin it. However, if finally, after many turns, you manage to get the raw egg to rotate, it's hard to get it to stop spinning. If you do pick it up and put it back down, the egg will start rotating again, because the inertia of the liquid inside it is still going forward. You only stop the shell from spinning. Something like this may have happened to Venus. Wait a minute. Venus? Backspin? Tennis? Hmm, I think there's a connection here, somewhere. We know that on Venus, <clears throat> the planet, one day is longer than one year. It takes longer for Venus to slowly rotate around backward one time than it takes Venus to orbit the Sun once. But Venus is slowing down dramatically, and by 6.5 minutes in the last 25 years. If there still is liquid inside Venus and the movement continues, we might see Venus completely stop spinning backward and start rotating forward again. Ah, come on Venus, let's get with the crowd! This business of retrograde and prograde rotation has got quite a bit of mystery to it. It seems that everything tends to rotate in prograde motion. If you shape your right hand like a ball and stick your thumb up to indicate north, then curl your wrist towards you, that's prograde motion. Your fingers on the left side of your hand are moving towards you. Black holes, solar systems, galaxies, atoms, stars, etc. all seem to rotate prograde, depending on which angle you view them from. Experiments at the Large Hadron Collider indicate that subatomic particles spin toward the left, prograde. It's starting to look as if we may be in a left-handed universe. Then why is it so hard to find a left-handed manual can opener or measuring tape? I don't know. It's a mystery. Attention! Attention! Residents of all countries and cities of the world! A massive asteroid is approaching the Earth! Now its speed is several times greater than the speed of sound, and each day it accelerates even more. Once it enters our solar system, it will fly past Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars. The gravitational fields of these planets will also accelerate the asteroid, and our planet will be the final destination. A collision is inevitable. According to scientists, a meteorite the size of Mount Everest can destroy the entire planet. The disaster will happen in 350 days. There's panic in the streets. People buy and build bunkers. Scientists and astronomers from all over the world were assembled to find a solution. The only way to avoid the collision is to destroy the space object. Yeah, 
A powerful rocket can split an asteroid into hundreds of thousands of pieces. In this case, a meteor shower will hit the Earth, but it's better than the complete destruction of our home. In less than a year, people build several powerful rockets. Then, using the best telescopes in the world, astronomers create a unique guidance system. And now, we just have to wait for the asteroid to get into our solar system. All the people start moving to one continent with top-notch bunkers for everyone. The damage from the asteroid is impossible to predict, so it's better to hide people in one super large safe place to wait out the collision. The moment has come. The asteroid passes by Uranus. The speed increases. Now the colossal space object moves only 10 times slower than the speed of light. Scientists launch rockets into the air. The asteroid flies past Saturn and destroys a part of its ring. The asteroid's trajectory is changing. It flies past other planets through a twisting path, picks up speed, and now heads towards the Earth. The rockets leave a long trail of fire behind and reach the speed of sound. They're getting closer to the asteroid. Near Mars, a collision happens. The rockets hit the target. The asteroid explodes and splits into millions of particles. All the pieces fly in different directions. The Earth is saved. At this moment, the Earth's satellites record a huge burst of energy. A small part of the asteroid is headed towards Earth. It's tiny, about the size of a grain of sand. But the explosion accelerated it, and now the grain of sand is flying towards the Earth at a speed of 185,000 miles per second, which is 99% of the speed of light. At this speed, the grain has almost the same destructive power that the entire asteroid had. It's approaching the moon. A few more seconds, and the grain of sand will hit our planet. All the people are waiting with bated breath. The grain gets such incredible power because of the laws of physics. The greater the speed any object is, the more mass and energy it has. When the grain of sand reaches a speed close to the speed of light, its energy and mass begin to increase dramatically. You can't even see this tiny grain of sand, but inside, it has the mass of an entire continent. If the grain reaches the speed of light, its mass will be infinite, and then a black hole will appear. In this case, all living and even inanimate things on the planet will disappear. Trees, seas, and oceans, all the cities, countries, and continents, air, sound, atmosphere, any molecule of the Earth, everything will be absorbed by the incredible gravitational force of the black hole. Then, when there is no trace of our planet, the hole will take over the moon. The gravitational force will grow and absorb other planets of the solar system. Soon, it will reach the sun. Our star will split into thousands of strips like spaghetti and will emit a tremendous amount of energy. This could trigger the birth of a second black hole. But fortunately, we only have 99% of the speed of light, which changes everything. Also, no object that has mass can reach the speed of light. The grain of sand enters the Earth's atmosphere. From the outside, it looks like a blinding meteor that pierces the sky. The grain heats up, passing through the layers of the atmosphere. Clouds within a radius of 100 miles around are burning up. The sky becomes crystal clear. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see the air is ionized because the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The meteorite leaves an ozone hole behind it. So now, this place is not protected from space radiation and ultraviolet light. The grain of sand flies straight into the center of the southern ocean. The closest continent to the explosion is Antarctica. The air around it warms up and mixes with the cold temperature of the ocean, creating hurricanes. As soon as the grain approaches the ocean surface, the water starts boiling. The temperature and energy of the grain are so huge that the water evaporates, but the vapor molecules are instantly burned up. Thousands of gallons of water just disappeared from the face of the Earth. The grain flies down for the first few feet without touching the surface as the water evaporates before it. Then it falls into the ocean and creates a powerful explosion. Hundreds of millions of gallons of water foam and boil because of the hot temperature. The entire ocean within a radius of 100 miles is illuminated with a bright light. 
The ocean depths, where sunbeams have never been before, are almost as transparent as the water at the bottom of a pool. The wreckage of old sunken ships splits into atoms because of the powerful explosion. Unknown sea monsters and giant squids that live in the dark are afraid of the bright light and swim away. Then, finally, a grain of sand touches the seafloor and penetrates deep into the Earth's crust. If it reaches the Earth's core, the planet will most likely explode from a burst of incredible energy. Fortunately, this is not going to happen. The resistance of the ocean and the ground slows down the grain and takes its energy away. It provokes a slight shift of tectonic plates, and there's more to come. Huge waves form and spread throughout the ocean. The blast wave creates enormous tsunamis. Imagine throwing a small rock into a puddle. The same thing happens to the ocean. Huge waves are approaching the coastal cities. Fortunately, people were evacuated from there. But the damage caused by one grain of sand will cost hundreds of trillions of dollars. Houses are destroyed, roads are flooded. After a while, it starts raining with hurricanes. Ocean water vaporized by the grain forms into huge storm clouds. The wind drives them to the continents. And then, after the tsunami, prolonged rain begins, flooding entire countries. Several days later, natural disasters are still here. The temperature of the Southern Ocean has increased by several degrees. The water is boiling at the collision site, melting the Antarctica glaciers. Millions of icebergs are melting away, so the water level of the world's oceans is rising. The edges of some continents go underwater forever. Thunderclouds reach the Sahara and other deserts. The shift of tectonic plates causes earthquakes on some continents. Volcanoes are awakening. The sky is filled with volcanic ash. It will take months for all the ashes to settle. In the beginning, it creates challenging conditions for life on Earth. Plants and all living things don't receive enough sunlight. In trees and seaweed, photosynthesis is disrupted. Oxygen production stops. It's getting harder to breathe. The air that has filled the planet's atmosphere is slowly running out. People have to adapt to new conditions. They build new cities both on the land and in the ocean. They create plantations with artificial lighting for photosynthesis production. Fortunately, all the problems end when the ash settles. Inside the volcanoes, there's hot magma flowing. It may come in handy as it's rich in chemical elements and minerals. Together with the ash, nutrients fall to the ground and the soil is now well fertilized. Plants, trees, fruits, and vegetables grow incredibly fast and produce a lot of new oxygen. The Sahara is filled with blooming flowers now, and it looks more like a meadow with flowers, not a desert. The grain of sand just renewed the planet instead of destroying it.